Good evening and welcome to The Word, Sligo Central Library's monthly literary event run in collaboration with staff and students of the BA in Writing and Literature, ATU Sligo. We are delighted to host this special edition with photographer John Minahan and Sligo musicians Liam Kelly and Michael Holmes. Welcome to all of you, our audience here in Sligo Central Library and to those watching on our live stream. Firstly, to introduce musicians Liam Kelly and Michael Holmes who really need no introduction here in their hometown. They began playing music in national school in Sligo and are founding members of the traditional Irish group Dervish. With Dervish, they have toured all around the world playing festivals from Glastonbury to Rio de Janeiro for the last 33 years. When they celebrated their 30th anniversary, they were awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the BBC. So we're delighted to have Liam and Michael with us and thank you for that lovely opening to the event, Two Jigs made on the green and the bank of turf. To introduce John Minahan, photographer born in Athai, County Kildare, 
moved to London at the age of 12. Following an apprenticeship with the Daily Mail, John became the youngest staff photographer for the Evening Standard. And as a freelance photographer, his work has featured in numerous exhibitions. Using a 35mm Nikon, black and white film and gelatin paper, his photographs of Samuel Beckett, Francis Bacon, Lady Diana Spencer, William Burroughs and so many others have become instantly recognisable. He was described by William Burroughs as a painless photographer. Now living in West Cork, John began a project with Sligo Libraries in 2009 when he came to Sligo to photograph Sligo writers living here. Uh, that project was for a literary room in our new library. So this year in 2022, when we invited John back, we thought we'd have the new library, but <laughs> hopefully soon. So earlier this year, John returned for a second phase of this collection of Sligo writers, and that beautiful collection is hung behind us this evening. So it's our privilege to have John with us this evening for his presentation of Beckett in the Wake. Thank you. Oh. Age is catching up. Hello, Una. How are you? Um, first of all, um, Patricia, that was a wonderful presentation, and I want to say I wanted to be born in a thigh, but I was actually born in Dublin. I had no choice in the matter. But to be born in a thigh canticle there would have actually fulfilled all my dreams. Anyway, uh, for 60 years I've been taking black and white photographs. I'm not a digital photographer because I understand the importance of digital photography and watching the lads and the girls. It's important in the, in the world we live in today. The world is ever escalating, not necessarily in a good way. But and the innovations in digital photography, every, every week they're changing. They're, it's not a new, like, you know, the new thing, high definition. I remember having a conversation with John Banville last year who, who is a, probably one of the writers who loves writing about photography. He's got more books on photography in his library than they have in the Museum of Modern Art. He really is an aficionado of photography. And John said to me, you're right, we don't see in high definition. It's just one of those gadgets that happen. Anyway, um, one of the lads showed me how to work this now. That was me in Paris, the home of photography when I was out there. Uh, where's James? Is he here? I'm supposed to just press something. Oh, here we go. Uh, now, is this the first picture? I'm never sure. Anyway, <clears throat> the picture of me in Paris was taken because I had an exhibition there for some reason, but also Paris is important to me because it was the home of black and white photography. We wouldn't know what Baudelaire looked like if it wasn't for Nadal. We wouldn't know for Victor Hugo. I saw, in the 60s, I saw a photograph of Victor Hugo on his deathbed taken by Nadal. Incredible. I mean, it was just full of emotion. I thought, that's it. And, you know, coming from a side county called there, I was very familiar with deathbeds. I don't know how many, there's a nipper running around, silhouetted figures inside when somebody passed away. And these women and men, at that moment in time, reverentially, you know, dressing up the body and bringing in, it was, the, it was a time in Ireland, it was a time that I liked actually, uh, of that time of polished old wooden floors with nuns running up and down the hospitals and doing things. I mean, that's the kind of Ireland I liked and I photographed. And from 1962, I was photographing the thigh because at that point I was in London where my life really changed. I always remember getting off the, you know, at 15 years of age, uh, sorry, nine years of age, being taken to London on the boat and hearing a foreign language for the first time when I got to Wales. I couldn't understand where I was going to. And then the boat train going in to Euston Station, full of smoke and all those columns. At that moment in time, I knew my life had changed because I ended up being a, an office boy stroke messenger on the Daily Mail. And um, it was my job to replenish paper lockers, to make chemicals. You know, all that alchemy, young photographers don't understand. 
the miracle of seeing something appear before the eyes, and it is a miracle. It's something wonderful because now with the, you know, as I said, these kind of what they call smartphones and people are taking photographs. As I speak to you right now, in Times Square in New York, there's hundreds of people taking photographs of neon lights. They don't know why they're doing it, but they can because they want to. Because they have become victims of corporate assassins because they don't want you to think anymore. That Rolleiflex I have there takes 12 pictures. When I talk to young photographers or if they want to approach me, and I hope they do, I try and tell them, don't allow yourself to, your soul to be given to these kind of things. But with a Rolleiflex, you have to think. It only takes it's a roll of film. You have to 12 exposures, so you're thinking all the time. Um, in the, the genesis of the photo, the reason why I call it Beckett and the Wake is because the, the pictures of Beckett, this monumental figure in literature, and always bear in mind, you know, photography and, and literature has been a marriage since uh, Louis de Gaulle uh, uh, exclaimed from his balcony, I have arrested the light. It was that kind of importance when photographers and writers came together. Writers who, I mean, we would, I mean, James Joyce collaborated with um, Sylvia, Sylvia Beach and Henry Miller with Brassai and um, I suppose to a small degree, people will remember my pictures and somebody said over the last couple of years, the perception they have of Beckett comes from my photographs, my black and white pictures, I, you know, which is lovely. But how it happened, in 1969, I'm an apprentice in the, daily, I'm sorry, in the evening standard. I'm a, I'm a photographer, a fully-fledged young, 21, well, I was 20, 23 then. And a backbench, can you imagine newspaper offices then, the melody of typewriters, you know, the incessant sounds of mobile, of, of telephones, you know, sub-editors with their shirts rolled up. And on this particular uh, summer of 1969, some backbench sub screamed out to the picture desk, some obscure Irish writer called Samuel Beckett has just been awarded a Nobel Prize for Literature. And I was at the picture desk. I was quite keen about it. Who's this obscure, reclusive Irishman I'd never heard about? And from that moment, I made up my mind to chase him down. Also, it was a time when the IRA were bombing London. And being Irish, it wasn't the most fashionable thing to be at then. And I needed to find myself some feel-good stories. So I made it my business to try and track down Mr. Beckett. Somebody gave me an address in Paris, which was the wrong address. Had it been the right address, I now know, he would have written back on one of those distinctive cards. But... It didn't happen, but in the meantime, I was running around Soho with, Fran with, 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 with Francis Bacon, another Dubliner, born two years after Beckett. They were very similar in, in strange kind of ways. I think Bacon was a little frightened of Beckett because Beckett was darker. It's strange to think that, but it's true. And I, I, I wanted to photograph, and I wanted to do an exhibition of the two lads, Bacon, Beckett, and, and William Burroughs, who was a satellite around, you know, uh, well, he lived in Tangier with, with, with Francis Bacon. And, of course, Burroughs was a huge fan of, of, uh, of Bacon. When I told him I was going to have this exhibition called Bacon, Beckett, and Burroughs, he was so excited. He really didn't think too much about Bacon, although I have photographs of linking each other. And at that time, like... You know, taking photographs in black and white is an expensive process. That's what it began. I've never thought too much about money. I always like to have a few bob in my pocket. But it was never the thing. The thing was buying the film, putting it in the camera, and paying my printers to, to produce what's behind me, the best black and white you can see. And that's what I've been doing for 60 years. Now... In, in London at that time in the UK, there was a building society called the Bradford, the Bradford and Bingley Building Society. And I thought that would be a good idea for me to write to them, to the, uh, to the, the, the manager in, in Huddersfield, to say, look, um, I'm doing this exhibition called The Three Bs, called Bacon, Beckett, Bacon and Burroughs. Would you like to sponsor it? I needed £5,000 to print the catalogue. 
And they sent me back a curtly note saying, really sorry, wish you luck, but it's not going to happen. A week afterwards, I managed to get an Irish building company called the Clancy Group to do it. Now, my life has always been like that. It's either been Irish builders or, or Vince Power from the Mean Fiddler, who saw me one day. I'd just come out of the Arts Council in Dublin. You know, the Arts Council, those who do. Some are lucky, some are not. I've, uh, anyway, I needed the 5,000 to do another book on Irish writers called An Unweaving of Rainbows. A title I didn't give it was given by the UK publishers. It comes from something that George Bernard Shaw. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm outside the Shelburne on this February dark and rather cold day, and Vince Power said, John, what are you doing? I said, Vince, I'm, I'm doing this book, and I have two sets of black and white photographs, 110 pictures from everyone, from Beckett to the grave of WBH, uh, to everybody. And if you give me sponsor this, you can have a set of the pictures that were that size and gel printed lovely. I mean, John, do it. You don't have a problem. Send the invoice to the Main Fiddler Trust. And if you buy, if you see the book out there, it says sponsored by the Main Fiddler. You know, so rock and roll. So that's been the story of my life up to date. So anyway, I wanted to do this exhibit. I had it in my head for a long time. Bacon and Bacon and Bacon and Bacon and Burroughs. And then uh, one day I'm in a pub in London called the Oxbridge Arms. Funny enough, Lucy and Freud used to live across the road, whose that was his studio. And a friend of mine, Liam, who used to work as a kitchen porter in the High Park Hotel, said, John, Samuel Beckett is in town. And I said, well, I, I knew Liam was a ferocious reader of Irish literature. I mean, everything from Paddy Kavanagh to, you know, he just loved, and he was a big fan of Beckett. That afternoon, I went straight down to the High Park Hotel, dripping in Nikon cameras. And I went to the reception. I said, look, I, I would like to speak to Samuel Beckett. The lady said, absolutely not. We don't have anyone here called Samuel Beckett. So I knew, in fact, Liam was, if he told me he was there, he was there. I wrote a note, dear Mr. Beckett, my name is John Minahan. For the last 20 years, I've been photographing my hometown of Thai County for there. I understand your aversion to, to, to newspapers, journalists, and photographers. I understand that. But I have 20 photographs of a Thai, and, and especially sequence on the wake of Katie Turrell. I think you might like to have a look at. Bearing in mind understanding that I'd have, I had 10 years earlier gone through a lot of stuff knowing that Beckett is the quintessential black and white photographer. His images, you know, are, you know, from his plays, you know, from Endgame to Godot to Happy Days. I mean, in black and white, I, I knew, and also bearing in mind that the great Russian director who made the, pat, the battleship Potemkin, when Beckett was in Paris and had seen that film, I don't like to use the word movie because it wouldn't be what Beckett saw that film and wrote to Eisenstein to ask if he could work as an assistant in film in Moscow. <clears throat> the letter that Beckett wrote is in the first, there's four volumes of correspondence of Beckett, and in the first volume, that letter is in there. So I knew Sam would understand, and maybe come to, maybe he might, you know, warm towards me, to, or to my honesty. I left the letter in, but the lady said, make sure, Mr. Beckett, that I'll be calling tomorrow at nine o'clock, which I did. The following morning, I phoned up and the receptionist uh, heard called up. I said, Minahan, blah, 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 hold on. And this gentle Dublin voice, hello, Mr. Minahan, how are you? Thank you for your note. How about nine o'clock tomorrow, the following day? And I'd love to see the photographs of the wake. And I was ecstatic about that. Thank you, lovely, because... I thought, well, you know, I mean, that afternoon I went back to Fleet Street and I was drinking with some Irish friends of mine, Stan Gabler Davis, who was a wonderful writer who, who'd done so much, and I was in Nelvino's, and I said, Stan, tomorrow I'm going to see Samuel Beckett at nine o'clock, and he kind of nearly choked on his burgundy. Samuel Beckett, where? And of course I realized then, you, you know, I can't really say too much. He said, well, make sure you talk to him about cricket. That's what Stan said, I know nothing about cricket. But the next day at, 12 at 9 o'clock, I went down to the High Park Hotel, reception called up. I was expecting the man to come down to the foyer and go through the usual kind of 
you know, gentility is, hello, John, how are you, lovely? Would you like a cup of tea or just enough to 20 minutes? Goodbye. But that's not the kind of photographer I am. Because I wanted to hang Beckett on the wall. I wanted to hang him up. Because I understood how mesmeric this man was as a, as a writer. Published by a small publisher. Here we are in the great conglomerate of publishing house where one big conglomerate eats up another one. When really distinguished writers are cast aside. And here's Beckett published by Jerome Landon in Paris. John Calder, his UK publisher, and of course Barney Rossett, whose mother was Irish, in the United States. And yet, as I talk to you right now, there's not an acre on the planet that's not waiting for the visitation of Godot. So I was asked to go to his room, room 604, on the sixth floor. And every moment I was thinking, even up, as I walked down the dark corridor to his room, 604, knock on. And this gentle human, I mean, the man couldn't have been, um, I mean, a lot of so-called, you know, professors of literature, John, what was he like? I haven't got a clue, I say to them. The pictures actually surfaced through ignorance on one hand and through my photographs with Ty on the other. The pictures, as you'll see, are not in any particular order, Sam would like that, so... I had a lot of photographs of Sam in the hotel room. You saw one that was taken in the bedroom. Because he's looking at my pictures of a thigh. And he's coming across all characters. You know, two old lads outside um, Emily Square, the bus stop, waiting for the only bus coming in at that time in the morning to a thigh on its way to Kilkenny. And the characters are trying to see who's going to get off. I mean, they may have known these guys. I knew, and I, well, I didn't know, but I knew when Sam was looking at my photographs, I was, I was photographing Beckettian characters. And then he looked at the white pictures. I, I didn't realize then, but he understood exactly what I was photographing. To have all the pictures, this was um, 19, this is 1985 in Paris, because I had, I photographed Sam first in London in 1980, and then in Paris in 1984 when he, was, he came over again to direct the San Quentin Drama Group. Imagine, Rick Clusey, who founded the San Quentin, who spent 12 years incarcerated on a murder charge, gets to be directed by one of the, certainly, uh, you know, one of the great writers of the 20th century. And that's the mark of who Samuel Beckett was. He's there, you know. Uh, it's all wrong, Rick, or something like that, to be screaming out. I'd be terrified, listen, but... He was so reverential to people. I mean, they were just... And anyway, I knew I had to get Beckett in his hometown, his chosen city, Paris. He's a man who hung out with Man Ray. He's a man who, you know, of course, the Irish writers who went to Paris, George Moore, James Joyce, John Millington Singh, and of course, Yeats, and of course, Wilde, they all crisscrossed each other's parts. Beckett was in the mix of all that. And I needed to get him in Paris. And I wrote to him. And he said, Minahan, I'd be glad to see you in Paris, provided you leave your camera at home. Well, I expected him to say, but how? And he knew, in fact, well, Minahan won't come to Paris. But I did see him in, the, in a, a hotel called the PLM on Boulevard Saint-Jacques, five minutes walk from his apartment. And I didn't have a camera. And from... From 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 o'clock, we were chatting away, and all Sam wanted to know about was Owen O'Brien's book, you know, which he put in Irish, con Owen O'Brien's wonderful book about Beckett's uh, Irishness, you know. And of course, I, 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 I'd met Owen once, and it's a wonderful book, and um, he'd be asking me about the price of a pint of Guinness in MacDade's, or in or Neary's, or the Irish pint, he loved that. But he was making me feel relaxed. And when you look at, when you look at the, the, the photograph, when you read the photograph like you read uh, a paragraph, you see that the, the, the natural light is dissipating and the artificial light is come on. Now, this was taken, like, when, when I'm with him on the Saturday, towards the end of the conversation, Anthony Cronin asked me, knowing 
you're 80 the following year, in 80, 1986, he would have been 80. And of course, there was going to be celebrations in Paris, London, Dublin, and New York. Could we get a new portrait for uh, knowing you will not be in Ireland and you probably won't be in anywhere? He said, John, great, come back tomorrow at three o'clock and bring your camera. And that's how that picture surfaced, because that morning I woke up and I went to Pierre Lachaise to photograph the tomb to Oscar Wilde, fearing that Mr. Beckett might say to me, what did you do today? Well, Sam, I went to Pierre Lachaise Cemetery, you know, and I didn't realize a lot of his buddies were buried in there, apart from Oscar Wilde and but anyway, um, it just brings joy to me because I, as I'm talking to you right now, I feel he's over my shoulder because he knows I'm one of the good guys. A lot of people out there have done Beckett or not. They do it for different reasons. We're talking, at three o'clock was the appointed hour where he was going to meet me. I got there at two o'clock, sat by the window because, you know, for film photographers, light is the most important ingredient. So I sat down, and there was a clock over the entrance as he came in. I saw him smiling. I can see him now as he's walking in, because he knows why I'm sitting where I, I'm sitting. So from 3 o'clock until half past 4, and I thought the, the moment's going to go. We're talking about everything. We're talking about... He's talking to me about Beckett, and he's talking about Bloomsday, and I said, Sam, were you ever had the pictures of Bloomsday? Which I couldn't remember, and I don't think he was. And then the, at half past four, 20 to five, do you want to take a picture here? And I had a, a Hasselblad with a wide angle lens because I wanted to, you know, this is Beckett in Paris. And two screens, I'm looking at that one, is easier. Um, and his eyes have left me. You can see two coffee cups, one is his and one is mine. And there was, uh, uh, there was three frames. That's all, three frames. And then we went outside, and I took a few more pictures. And I took a, I took a, a photograph. Edna O'Brien asked me, because she was always on about Sam's eyes. They were so blue. You must get a picture of his eyes. Because writers don't understand the mechanics of photography and how it works. It's not that easy to go up to the man and say, look, I want to photograph your eyes. But I did take a picture in 1980 for Edna of Sam sitting on the bed, which made the cover of a book I did called Centenary Shadows. And he does have the most piercing blue eyes, which is amazing. Anyway, I knew I had something special in that photograph. Five minutes later, the light would have gone. It would have been impossible. I remember the exposure at that time. Holding a Hasselblad, it's quite a big camera. And that was a fifteenth of a second. I 5.6. But I always feel I'm God's photographer and it's going to work because I believe in miracles all the time. Um, when I left the, the, the coffee shop with Sam, we were in that side, this was another shot I did just of Sam wearing a, a tartan duffel coat. This is Beckett directing Beckett. He's directing his masterpiece, Waiting for Godot, at the Riverside Studios in 1984. The man looking into his eyes is a wonderful German director called Walter Asmus, who Beckett designated as his assistant while he was alive and after he would have passed on. Walter Asmus would direct the work. And again, I was so lucky because in 1984, a kind of long, what they call a long lens, was kind of, you know, a little bit bigger than they have today. But in black and white photography, I know, you know, computer-generated images love to mimic black and white photography. But you know, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I'm sorry. I'll go to my grave still taking black and white images. As I said, everything about Beckett, I wanted to hoover up with my cameras. Even, you know, the Beckett people know about his famous Deja Vu, what's it, Deja Vu, the Citron. Um, many writers um, would talk about being driven by Beckett around the, those narrow streets in Paris. 
feeling, as John Calder told me, I took my life in my own hands driving with Becky. Um, this car became available to me in Ireland about nearly 16 years ago. A young man, I can't mention his name because he still has the car, but, but even in the ashtrays, there were still butts. And I photographed the logbook. It gives you the provenance of where it came from. And when they built the Samuel Beckett Bridge, I suggested to some, you know, gobshite, the first car over the bridge should be that car. Now, it never happened. I don't know why. I mean, the Sam, I mean, the Samuel Beckett boat, I have the picture of Sam in the cafe, it's in the captain's cabin there, but that should have been the first car over the Samuel Beckett, it just didn't happen. Sam would have liked that. But anyway, that's a, but it's all part because, you know, today in, in the world as a photographer, it's, some photographers think they're more important than the people they photograph. That's a mistake. Because in this celebrity-driven world, Photographers are not more important than the people. They're just recorders, documentarians. My job, as was given, was to photograph the best. Certainly in my own country, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to be the man the Irish to photograph Beckett. Because he was a very proud Irishman. And he loved his friends who would go and visit him with a bottle of Jameson or Bushmills. He loved all that. And I wanted to photograph everything about this writer that I could. Even his letterbox where he lived with his wife, Suzanne, on Boulevard Saint-Jacques. It was a rather kind of strange 1960 block of flats. Nothing really you'd look at more than once. I had about 12 apartments and letterboxes just, you know, you know, from one to 12 with the name Beckett. I knew the name, that was him, because there seemed to be more, cars, more letters in that box than anywhere else. That's the logbook for the car. I mean, you know. This is Beckett directing an American actor called Bud Thorpe in the 1980 production of Endgame. And you know, bearing in mind Rick Clushy, who I got to love in the end because, as I said, Rick spent 12 years on a, I mean, he shot a guy in Los Angeles at three o'clock in the morning because something happened. He went to get a bottle of Jack Daniels and this gentleman went for his gun in the, in the off license. And of course, over there, what's going So Rick Clushy had it and he shot him and he did 12 years. And Jerry Brown, who's governor of, uh, California at the time, commuted, uh, Rick was on death row, commuted his sentence to life. And he told me, he said, John, because I said, well, Rick, how did you, like I'm doing, how did you get immersed in the Beckett circle as, you know, this? He said, John, when I was sitting in my cell, imagine this man, he's a really hunky, interesting man, tattoos all over his body, he looks like a Maori warrior, but he was a warrior of a kind, and Beckett liked those kind of warriors. Not for Beckett, I mean, you know, um, Mervyn Bragg, Sam, we want you on the South Bank. That wasn't who he was. No, he would rather come to London direct an ex-convict. And Rick said, John, when I'm sitting in my cell one day, there's a traveling bunch of actors going around doing Samuel Beckett waiting for God. And I heard, the, I heard the language of these guys. And I was completely, that was it. I went to the governor of the jail, San Quentin. I said, listen, I want to do this with the lads. So they gave me what was called the hanging chamber. Now, hanging was abolished in the state of California back in the 40s. And they brought on other things to kill people with. So Rick used the hanging chamber as a rehearsal place and got the lads, you know, doing Beckett's plays. And then he was released after 12 years and he went to Germany where he met Beckett and um, to some wonderful correspondence from between Rick and Sam. And of course, <clears throat> no Irish writer would ever be the same without being seen at a bar. And of course, this is uh, Beckett with Alec Reed. I mean, some people would know about Alec Reed, who taught at Trinity, who was, a, who was a companion of Beckett back in the day. And of course, with the lads playing the music, 
During the interval of music, at the, so in the Riverside Studios in London, there was Irish music. You can't see the Irish musicians in the photograph, but they're playing on that Saturday afternoon. Sam is actually smiling. This is a shot which is... And he knows I am there trying to be as discreet as I can. Because the photographers I know are looked upon now as bounty hunters, not particularly sort of uh, social outcasts. I've never taken a photograph of any way that didn't want to be photographed. This is Sam coming out of Riverside Studios, and there's a sequence of pictures on this, on this particular roll because his fans are outside, and every, everybody wanted to court him and sign books. I wanted to do this picture of Beckett from the back because we're always assaulted by the front, we know. But I remember seeing a picture of his companion, James Joyce, taken in Paris in the day. And he's, he's in a chaplain-esque kind of thing with, a, with, a, with an umbrella hanging under his arm and he's just from the back. And you know it's James Joyce. I was like that. And I wanted to get this picture of Sam from the back because if I hang the picture up, you know, Sam is walking away and not long after that, he's, he passed on. And in the satchel, now that satchel um, was published in Vogue about three years ago. Again, how people, you know, just pick up on things. This is Beckett and his Louis Vuitton bag. How people, you know, Beckett would, I mean, he's more like a pennies man than Louis Vuitton. This, for me, is the important sequence of photographs. Probably the most important set of photographs I've ever taken are the Asahi photograph. For 34 years, I'm photographing my hometown, Asahi County Kildare. Of course, Beckett, and, I mean, Beckett knew about Asahi because he was great friends with Joyce. And of course, Joyce has that wonderful line where the two lads walking on the beach, Stephen D, somewhere in Dublin. And one says to the other, what part of the body is called after an Irish town? That's high. And, um, but you look at the photograph and you see Mrs. Tyrrell in repose. Above her head was a kind of sepia photograph of one of her daughters who died earlier. And the mirror is shrouded with a white sheet. Because the local, I was remember them telling me, the mythology surrounding death. Look at me, for you're looking at a reflection of yourself, for death is the beginning. I was familiar with that because from the age of three and four, like the first time I ever saw a photograph, I think I was taking the mass. And my aunt and uncle, I was brought up by my aunt and uncle, because my father died before I was born, and my mother basically dumped me, left me with her sister, my aunt, and then went to England and married again, had another four stars. <coughs> Honestly, I'm not going to cry. Another four sons. But they get very annoyed when I, when I talk about my uh, mother like that. But it's the truth. And th that's the only way I find, you know, to tell the truth. I always remember meeting my mother once or twice in Dublin. And there was eight sisters. You know, it was a real Irish family. Eight sisters, three brothers. And we were t I was taken up to Dublin because my mother was going to be there with one of the sisters and her always appeared to me to be terribly grand because her husband used to work with Jacobs. And I, I remember sitting on the floor eating one of those crackers or something. And uh, my mother came in, and on the mantelpiece was a photograph, a wedding photograph of my mother and my father. And she looked at me and said, you're not as handsome as your father. Now, at that moment, my mother lit a... Uh, a candle inside me which has never been extinguished because I understood at that moment that I was on my own. We're all on our own all the time. You know, and there are moments one has to nourish that thought. The wake is important to me. Um, Mrs. Tyrrell, I'll get a picture, I can close up here, you can see she looks absolutely majestic in death, in the Legion of Mary burial throughout. Now, bearing in mind, Samuel Beckett is looking at these photographs, too. I believe wholeheartedly in what they say to me. I believe that I was meant to, to do this, 
and the connection with Samuel Beckett. As long as, you know, people are uh, uh, looking at Beckett, they'll be uh, looking at some of the pictures of a side because they would never have been published. When the publishers in the UK wanted to publish Beckett, I said only on one condition that we do my side pictures, which was called Shadows from the Pale. It's a hardback book. It's out there now. And of course, black and white picture books are, uh, you know, on the net. They can be very expensive. And Shadows from the Pale can be three or four hundred pounds and a thousand dollars, depending on the condition. But it's a very evocative book of a period of time, my time as a young lad. Anyway, I'm 16 when I started taking the pictures there in 1962. But Mrs. Tyrrell, look at me for you looking at a reflection of yourself. Now, I was saying to Donald and Patricia today that the Legion of Mary, the, 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 the undertaker and his had run out of burial shrouds of Legion of Mary, so they had to import them from France. Now, I'm not linguistic, but I, I make it as you, make blah, blah, blah. But there's Mrs. Turrell looking like a chieftain, and of course she was. Another tribe who lost their lands, funny enough. The family... Um, the lady on the extreme left, she, I had an exhibition of the photographs in a, in a gallery in Mayfair. It was just called The Wake of Katie Tyrrell. There was a gentleman called Pat Matthews who owned the gallery. It was right next to the Connacht Hotel. And Pat had seen my pictures in the photographic magazine and said, John, I can't believe this. It's like in Israel and Mount Olives. We, it's very similar to what we do. Can we have an exhibition? So I had 20 of my pictures on exhibition in this gallery. Mrs. Dalton, the daughter of Mrs. Tyrrell, sent a solicitor's letter to me to try and get the pictures removed. My solicitor on the paper, a man called Eddie Young, said, what's the problem, John? I said, well, I had this letter from... And this woman is she's accusing me of of um, invading their privacy. And I said, I was, anyway, I said, I was given permission. And funny enough, I have a photograph of the lady who's accusing me of being an intruder. She's posing, looking into my time. Give me that photograph, leave it to me. Nothing else was heard of again. Because of course, I would never do that because I, I just respect that. But here you have, you know, the remains of Mrs. Tyrrell being put into a coffin. You see, life is energy in this movement. But still Mrs. Tyrrell, from the box, is very still like a statue. She's saying, look at me. You know, she's dead, but she hasn't. She's looking at me. In. This is 60 watt bulb over the thing, the family saying the rosary. And I'm on a chair looking down. And I, I know what's happening. Because I've seen all this growing up in the thigh for the few years I was there. You know, horse hearses and people praying and drinking barrels of Guinness and, and the faces. I mean, if you look at the faces of the people, there's a generation of well-worn faces who endured poverty. Great hardship at the time. But, you know, I mean, they had their faith. I like this picture. It's one of the last pictures of Mrs. Tyrrell going into the, the, the medieval cemetery in Athai. And there's old uh, Celtic iron crosses. Sometimes you'd see, because families were very poor, it's, you'd see soldered onto the cross other members of a family. But it, again, it, the signature of the picture says, this is Irish, this is how we do it here. Of course, there's always Mrs. Tyrrell's contemporaries sitting around the old age piece talking about after the wake. Some people think they're my girlfriends. Well, of course, they are, actually. Um, I, I, of course, they were, and of course, it's amazing how m much information I extracted from people who would come up to me because for 32 years, I'm photographing this town, going back from London at least on average two or three times a year, taking countless rolls of film to put together this book which has about 120 pictures in it. And the book is used by film companies now because they want to know what the places looked like in 1962 
um, to have a source of material to draw on. This next section is, is important. A lot of the people who I would have photographed over the years, they've now passed on. Seamus Heaney. You know, as a photographer, I've always been drawn, I don't know why, towards poets. Probably like photographers, it's about the image. You know, you're going to see one of my dear friends who passed away in 29, Padraig Fiek, a northern poet like Seamus. But to me, Padraig Fiek was the poet of the troubles. But classic lines like, the prayer book is putting on fat within memoriam cards. Now that resonates with me because when I was taking the mass at about six to the St. Michael's Chapel, I remember a prayer book would be open, bulging with those very distinctive little black and white memoriam cards, which I've collected. Funny enough, people give them to me. I've got Wants from Bally de Hall, you know, Nana Byrne, 1921, you know. Um, I haven't because they mean something to me. It's always been, a, you know, for me to, to know that every second, like, as I'm looking at you, I'm looking at what's around you all, you know. Seamus had photographed, as I say, many times in the UK, in Ireland, of course. And this was taken for his 70th birthday in 2000. And I think it was 2012 or something like that. Many people say, what's he reading? Well, he's reading a book of poems by Thomas Merton. Talking about Beckett and publishers, this is one of the, probably one of the preeminent independent publishers of the 20th century in the UK, John Calder, who published 21 Nobel laureates. And John, of course, um, was, you know, had a cooperative group of actors, and you know, he'd come to Ireland about two or three times a year. He'd always talk about my house in Ballad Hob as a squalid place to stay. Well, I, I never quite got that because it was a large house with six bedrooms, and I managed to put up 12 actors. And he liked that because he wasn't fond of putting them in the Hilton or putting them anywhere else or, you know, paying for them. And he said, Millerhan lives in squalor in Ballad Hob. I don't live in Squall and Ballad Hub, but I did live with, surrounded by images and statues of the Madonna and other things. John is gone now, and um, when I took the pictures of Beckett, he came on to me. Like, the name of his autobiography is called Pursuit. Very aptly called by John, Pursuit, because as soon as I had photographs of Samuel Beckett, he found me, and for 30 years, he was using my pictures. I told him, John, put the pictures on the cover because Beckett is this mismerit man. People love him. And you'll sell more books. They were really, you know, they were just boring covers he had. Bacon and Beckett. Francis Bacon was born in 1906, two years after Samuel Beckett. The two lads came from... Uh, you know, like, came from very similar backgrounds. And I used to say to Bacon um, about Sam, and he never really wanted to know. I think he was, as I said, a little jealous of Beckett because Bacon cultivated people, intellectual giants in Paris, who cultivated his and gave credence to his work. Like, for example, uh, the wonderful sculptor, uh, sculptor, what's his name? Um, he done those skeletal fi figures. Do you know the one? This friend, huh? Jack and Metty. Yeah, Jack and Metty. Didn't have to phone a friend. I think. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. Jack and Metty collaborated in 1961 with Samuel Beckett, where Jack and Metty designed the tree, this early version of Waiting for God, though. It's extraordinary. And I remember saying to Edward Beckett, Beckett's nephew, Edward, what happened to that tree? Oh, don't tell me about it. When the students rampaged through Paris and went into the theater, the, the opera, theater de l'opera, that became a victim to vandalism. It was just destroyed. 
And, uh, and then, of course, a few years after that, Bacon cultivates Giacometti, of course, and this is it. But, the, you know, Beckett was not one. He, as I said, he wasn't a lovey type of character. He didn't have to be. As I speak to you now, if you go to Paris next week or next year, you go to Cemetery Montparnasse, and on Sam's grave, there'll be a bit of paper with a stone over it. Thanking, thank you, Sam, for, as people, it's almost, it's almost like, an, I find it, you know, strange. There's something beautiful about that. This photograph of Lady Diana Spencer, who's now left us, I got to know this lady for two weeks. I remember at half, quarter past six in the early morning of some September 1980, in a coffee shop in South Kensington, I was reading Nigel Dempster's column. Now, Nigel Dempster was very well tuned into the royal family. And he had a column, it was just a little paragraph that said, Prince Charles, as he then was, of course, our king. Well, not my king. But Prince Charles has relinquished his relationship with Sarah Spencer and is now courting her younger sister, Lady Diana, who works uh, in a kindergarten in Pimlico. Well, that Pimlico for me was only 10 minutes up the road, so into my Vauxhall Cavalier, I was up there, parked, knocked on the door, and a lady with a three-barrel name, who's the governess of the king, came out, and she said, I am the first person there, bearing in mind I'm working for an evening paper, and I know this is important. And I said, listen, uh, the story in the Daily Mail, obviously I'd love to... Um, uh, uh, speak to Lady Diana with the possibility of taking a photograph because the story now. Uh, oh, hold on a second. And within five minutes, this vivacious, bubbly teenager came out. Her innocence. I mean, she was quite giggly. And, and I said, Look, I'd love to take a photograph of you outside. It was a beautiful September morning with some, a couple of the children. We'll have to get permission from the parents, which is what the headmaster did. And I wanted to take the photograph in the pose of the Madonna and child. And that always interests me. I mean, it's just emblematic to me of love, the mother and child. Funny enough, when it went into the paper, they, the, the paper, bear in mind the evening time was a tabloid newspaper, they airbrushed out the other little girl in the photograph. So it just came straight down. But this is what newspapers do, you know. But for me, I was, I mean, I had lots of pictures of her, you know, done. And I sent her stuff. I, I had her outside sitting down. I sent it all back on a, with a dispatch writer. The picture editor at the time told me to stay there, which I did. Other photographers and television crews and journalists started turning up. She was not going to come out again to do any more photographs. I believe in sharing, and if people came to me and said, John, can you see, you know, you, you've spoken to the governor, can you ask him? And I did, I knocked the door, I said, listen, look. And I, I said a blatant line, as God is my judge, and I analyzed, it's possible we can do another few shots because something has gone wrong in the dark. Nothing went wrong. My photographs were on the front page of the Evening Standard, chosen by the dying of newspaper editors, Mr. Charles Winter. It was, you know, by midday, Diana was back in her apartment in Colohan Court, South Kensington, looking at these photographs. I had it, I cracked it. A certain photographer who works for the Sun goes around telling people he did it. I want to confront him on the God will spare me, I shall do it. I said, I did it. You may have taken countless hundreds of pictures of the royal family, but this one I did. I created that. And you came along and you just heard what I, what, I, what I created. That's it. But also some of them photographed it in color because it's about greed. Bearing in mind then, any picture, you know, most of the, to be a good photographer, it's about passion. And, you know, to, to love what you're doing. You're, you're doing something, it's not about you, but 
it, but you know, you gotta love what you're doing. And I knew when I saw Diana, I mean, I went back. I think two days after I took that picture, she came out and she was hounded by, you know, a really, I mean, it's sad. And she got into her car and she went to Berkeley Square in, near the American Embassy and she just parked her car and went crying, sat on a park bench crying. Now, I phoned up the picture editor and said, I'm not doing this. I was reprimanded. Well, you're not paid to make those decisions. Well, of course, I, I think exactly, I am paid. I'm an ambassador for whoever employs me, particularly I choose who I photograph. I'm not going to take a photograph of a young girl crying. In the same way, if an old man would have, he may have shot three people, but I'm not going to photograph. He's like, oh, bad heart. You know, type of, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I, I believe I couldn't do that. What I did was I bought a dozen roses. I went back to her apartment because I knew she knew who I was. I was the first photographer she saw, and she saw a lot of them around the world. I rang her doorbell on the, she lived on the second floor. Rang the doorbell, went across to the other side of the road, knowing she'd look out the window and see me holding a bunch of flowers, which she did. And she came down and said, oh, I'm really sorry. And she was really apologetic about And I said, I said listen, you've got nothing to apologize for. This is from the bona fide photographer. I mean, look, you haven't. And we all remember what happened when uh, Idi Amin, like, they called him, like, and just people with those phone cameras and they're beating them to death and they're taking photographs. We haven't learned much in 2,000 years, have we really? I mean, it's, you know, this is the craziness of the world. I gave her the flowers and I was taken off the story after that. But I was, every time I see her, and of course, I believe to this day that, you know, it wasn't an accident. I don't believe for one moment that was a terrible accident. I don't believe that the driver went and had another glass of Dubonnet. You don't do that when you're driving around one of the most important women in the world at the time. You don't say, you know, you know I mean, we live in these troubled times, strange times, for certain rooms in Whitehall, you know, and strange things happen. People disappear. You know, we all know about the funny umbrella with the pies and tip. Diana left us, but she was rather prophetic because she knew, and she said it publicly on the television, that, you know, this family, you know, um, they're very, um, very powerful. And she was by, her, she was by herself. Um, anyway, the, and the day goes by when I, when I, she's not in my legions of comrades, I think about when I pray to these people, Diana, because, you know, because, you know, I ain't going to suffer from dementia because when I pray for people I love, and I'm going back 40 years, and I can see them, and I know their names, and I, it's about prayer. It's about, you know, I mean, it's just... This photograph of Padraig Fiuk is a poet who's so, uh, he's so, he's so dear to my heart. Because I was drinking, in 1984, I was in Belfast, I was staying in the Europa Hotel for a couple of nights, and Brian Keenan, that wonderful writer, came to me and he said, John, you have to photograph, he knew my pictures of Beckett, but he said, you have to photograph Patrick Fiuk, which is a pseudonym for a man called Patrick Joseph O'Connor, born on the Falls Road. I said, yeah, and the following day it was organized. Brian arranged for Patrick to come down to the Crown Bar, a very famous Crown Bar, opposite the Europa. And lots of Guinness and lots of whiskey was, was taken that day. And I would go back to Belfast and meet Brian and take pictures of Padre, kept doing that. And then in 1986, I go back there, Brian is kidnapped. I can't believe this. He's kidnapped from one war-torn city and then he goes to another in, in the Lebanon, Beirut. I said, I have to do something about this. So I took over Padre Fiuk to London to do readings to keep Brian Keenan's memory alive and introduce him to other poets like John Heath Stubbs, like Jenny Joseph, people I knew. And, and he loved it being over there. 
earlier on this year, um, he died in 2019. And a week before he died, President Michael D. Higgins went to see him in the nursing home and started reading his poetry. And, and Patrick then is 94 years of age. Earlier on this year at UCC, I had a, an exhibition called The Poet of the Pagan City. You know, you know, Christians fighting Christians, Catholics and Protestants. It's a madness. And um, it also happened simultaneously in the Irish Cultural Centre in, in London. But to me, Padraig Fiach is to poetry what Francis Bacon was to painting. That kind of madness. I kind of like that. For 22 years, I've been going back and forth to Havana, Cuba, another country. There's a big stone in one of the streets. Ireland and Cuba, two countries lost says something else, but it's in three languages. But this lady here, I went to the ballet, and this, the ballet was founded by this woman called Alicia Alonso. And I knew when I saw her coming down those marble steps in the, in the theater, the National Theater of Havana, I had to photograph this. I was so excited, I was nearly as excited photographing Beckett. And it happened for me because they did a tour of the UK during three performances of Giselle, which was one of her favorite ballets. And they arranged for me to photograph, and that's where that picture was taken, in the Millennium Hall in Cardiff. And she said to her interpreter, tell Mr. Minahan, he's the first Irishman to come and visit me in Havana. And she invited me over again to the school, which is what I did. And she's passed on now, but Fidel Castro, when he got rid of the bad guys, he found her up in New York. She was a prima ballerina with the New York National Ballet. He said, Alicia, I want you to come home and create the best ballet company in the world. And of course, it is. This is a country for 65 years that's been under the, an embargo by the United States, which is terrible. I mean, it's not an evil of, a country of evil of access. It's, it's a warm country. It's just, you know, I mean full of writers and poets. I mean, you have to read what John Paul Sartre wrote about when he went there in 1960. Two years ago, one of my great friends, Derek Mann, passed away. This is Derek, photographed in Kinsale by his typewriter. Because I said, Derek, you know, there's going to come a time, like me with film, that people won't even know what a typewriter looks like. And I, had, and I said, you know, Derek liked the way I worked with the Raleigh Flex and film. And, and when, I went to, when I was in London, he would ask me to bring back typewriter ribbons. And I, I knew this wonderful Armenian man who had a, a typewriter shop in Chiswick. He used to repair them, sell them, Remington, just Olivia's, all this. So I used to bring back half a dozen rolls of um, ribbon for Derek. And of course... <coughs> Derek, um, funny today in, in one of the bookshops, I picked up a copy of Derek's poems, 1961 to 2020. And he's dedicated to, there's a prose poem dedicated to me called Resistance Days. And I bought that because the other copy I had three months ago, I gave to Van Morrison, who is another fan of Derek Mann's. And Padraig Fiak, I entered the two of them, you know, to explain. But that's basically it. I have to apologize. I've got a bit of a, maybe a cold coming, a bit of a sore throat, but I hope that was okay. Because, you know, was it okay? Uh, yeah. It's just, um, I was telling Donald and uh, Patricia, you know, over the last five days, my life kind of went topsy turvy because. My partner, well, she's selling her house, and uh, all of a sudden we have to leave by Friday, you know. So half of my stuff is in the lockup in Skibbereen, my books, pictures. Another half is in the car park in the glass house here, and another part in the, in the apartment flat that we're going to have. It's just crazy. Anyway, so, um, and then I managed to get up here last night in my little Persia. Uh, through prayer. It's a 06 Peugeot car. 
And that's why I say I'm, you know, you know, like Deirdre, um, there's about, I have 187 statues of the Madonna, which I've collected over the years, and it's great, because in Ireland, we're so modern now, we're up there, you know? And I would see the statues put on a tip. And um, there's certain aspects of the religion I like. Certain aspects I like. I remember in Skibbereen, there's an, the Sisters of Mercy, they've gone from Skibbereen. And I wanted to photograph them before they left. And I gave them one of my books, the Atai book with the weight. And, you know, they've had so much slugging off from the media, you know, this, and we all know about Bad people are bad, and but they're, happy. they're in every kind of space. And I said to the mother, there's only six of them left, and one of them had actually died a couple of days before, and I photographed her funeral. It's in the cathedral, churchyard. I said, how do you cope with that? And she said, you know, John, people forget. I cycled to school, and I was taught by the nuns. When I was sick, I was taken to the Mercy Hospital, looked after by the nuns. And, you know, other things. And I just thought, yeah. And, so, and um, she had no regrets. She was just happy. And I go around photographing that chapel, all this wonderful iconography, the statues and the this, and uh, the bedroom, nothing. Just a solitary space with a little crucifix. That's it. And this was the life. And... Uh, and that's what I do as a photographer. This is how I have to record some of the Irishness of things that were important to me before it all goes out the window. I don't, as I said to somebody, you know, I would, when God takes me, I want to go into the ground. I don't want digital cremation with smoke coming out the top. It means nothing. It's like the Rolleiflex. You know, I, I, have, I have a certain feeling about these things and... Um, and I know they're working because at 76 years of age, I don't know how I survived Fleet Street. I, and, you know, it's, and of course, to meet Samuel Beckett through the ordinariness of an Irish town in itself is extraordinary. If anyone wants any questions, I promise I won't lie. Oh, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Funny, the old pegs like when you stand up, it's amazing. When I have a shower and drop the soap, now it's harder for to pick up the soap, you know. Thank, thank you, John, for being so generous with your stories. We have a, a roving mic now, so we'll just pass yeah. this down if anybody has a question. John, thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, just a question for you. Do you still go back to Atai to uh, take photographs of the townspeople? I, I do. I go back to Atai um, at least once a year. Uh, a lot of my, I mean, bearing in mind, like Samuel Beckett, people who know Beckett are diminishing in number, yeah. as we speak. And people I knew in Atai are diminishing. But and there's a new breed of people coming in who come up to me, some young lads say, oh, you photograph my granny. You know, and I kind of like that, you know. Um, but I still go back there because a Thai is a multicultural town now. Mm. And there's a sign that says a Thai restaurant, which has the Thai Thai restaurant, you know. <laughs> uh, a Thai lends itself to these kind of things. But no, th th that town is an important town for me. Sure. And as Patricia, I would have loved to have been born there, but I was born in the Rotunda Hospital. My mother was probably outside the door smoking at the time. Um, as, when I, when I say that because when I drive around the tunnel, that's all I see. Uh, um, but no, um, Athai is important to me. It's my most important sequence of photographs. Sure, yeah. And do, do you, did you, stay, you, you took photographs in the square of all the yeah. townspeople, did you, did you take I did. I, I, I was actually, Agfa, Agfa once sponsored me to go into the square and uh, I was going to be on the Gay Burn show, which I was. But Agfa said, now John, we've got this big van and there's going to be about a couple of hundred people come into Emily Square. 
but you have to mention, you know, you'll recognize me. I'd be on an Agfa van, you know, the corporate man. Well, of course, I was on the Gay Burn show, and, so, and Gay prompted me and said, well, John, how will the people, how will they find you? Well, they'll find me. I'll be in the town square with a camera, you know, and that's all I said. And, of course, I didn't mention Agfa, which they, did, they dropped their sponsorship with me after that. John, how are you doing? Um, I, you had a photograph there of Francis Bacon and William Burroughs. I'd love to hear a story about that, if you could. Well, funny enough, you know, those two, I mean, William Burroughs, Norman Mailer said William Burroughs is like surfacing now as probably the most important writer um, in, in contemporary American life. I mean, he's just out there. Now, the two lads together, I mean, basically, they were 110% homosexual. And of course, they spent much time in Tangiers for the very obvious reasons that there was absolutely no governance about anything. Everything went. And of course, Burroughs, I remember when Burroughs, I was with him uh, on, on, uh, on another occasion when he had this exhibition of his paintings. You see, because his friend, you know, he was so dismissive of Bacon privately and about the amount of money Bacon's paintings were going for. Um, that he started painting himself because he had a love affair with guns. And he used to get these doors. His, his, the boys around him would pick up these old doors and he'd slash a can of red, a can of green, and he'd get a, a double barrel shotgun and shoot it and just write in William S. Burroughs. And people paid $15,000 for this. Now, to be fair to Bacon, Bacon who, as I said, I met, because Soho was such an important part of my life. Every city has its Soho. And, you know, like Soho in London in the 60s was a place to be. I still see those red, little red lights saying Lucille on the second floor. I never had any intentions of visiting Lucille on the second But they were always part of what that was all about. And the colony room, Muriel Belcher and Ian Board, who would always greet people with the, the refrain, hello, cunty, this is what happened. It was just a terrible. I remember Pauline Buick. Pauline had an exhibition in Cork Street. And she said, John, I want to go to the con. I said, oh, I'll organize it. I remember, I mean, Ian was always nice to me. I said, Ian, I'm bringing up a friend in a few hours. Do not greet her with your usual mantra. And Pauline was gracious, she was lovely, and she had a little notebook. And, um, and she loved being up there. And I remember her doing little sketches of Ian Board. But that was a really, that was a very vibrant time. Now Soho is full of coffee shops. I mean, you're just sinking into, well, again, it's, you know, Starbucks. I mean, who, who are Starbucks? I mean, in, in, in Zanzibar, there's a Starbucks. I mean, how does it get there? But anyway, that's the kind of weird side of my head, the way it works sometimes. But no, Burroughs and, and Bacon and Beckett, these three seminal people, I mean, but Sam is the top man. I mean, Burroughs said to me, John, I'm so excited to be hanging on the wall with Samuel Beckett. John, th thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm just curious about Edna O'Brien. You mentioned that it yeah. was she who suggested to you that you must take that photo of Beckett because of his eyes, his blue eyes. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'm just wondering, did you take any or many photographs of Edna O'Brien? I've been you? photographing Edna okay. since the, the late 60s. Because in London, like, Charing Cross Road was just full of bookshops. And... Um, that's when I first met Edna. I mean, she was the queen. I mean, she was the bond of me. She was out there then. And I remember I had an exhibition of the five photographs at the Royal Court Theatre in 1971. And, uh, and the, the, my exhibition was there because there were there was three Irish plays. It was a season of Irish plays. Brendan Bean's Richard's Cork Leg and another Irish writer who I forget at the moment but, um, oh yeah, Edna O'Brien's A Pagan Place. That was the other play. The, th the theatre critic of the Sunday Times, 
him and um, there was only two of them around at the time, and these two particular critics were important. I can't, so I can't remember his name now, but it, that Sunday, um, a piece came out and it said, I, uh, Harold Hobson, so Harold Hobson, he was a theatre critic, he said, I have no, I, I can't really say much about Brendan Behan's Richard's cork leg, but what I will say is John Minan's photographs of a thigh canticle dare, of a child crying by a coffin, a woman wholly obscuring a statue of the Virgin Mary, are sad, poignant, despairing, and sublime. That was in the Sunday Times. Edna invited me around on the Monday to have tea with her, which I went around. And I remember being with her. Now, as, I, as we speak about Edna, she lives in London. She's 90, just over 90. She's not really in great form. Two weeks ago, I went to see her Miss Mary play, Joyce's Women, which she was commissioned. And I mean, it's very dark, but I loved it. It's a lot about Lucia. And Miss, but it was just like, I just thought, yeah, this is a woman who... John Calder lived in Soho, which was where his publishing house was. And he gave a party, and he told me an Edna story which I like, and I know you like it. He said, John, Edna, like, she's written so much about Joyce, and Beckett, of course. These are heroes of hers. He said, I gave this party for Beckett on his arrival in London, and John had a big piano called a Beckstein. Now, I had a house in Chiswick once. I mean, most of my properties now go to people, women in my life. You know, you know, I loved them and give them a flat, give them a house. So I said to John, John, we'll have to get rid of the, uh, of the Beckstein. And then John told me this party he gave for um, Beckett. Sam, was, uh, Sam, his wife, Suzanne, was an accomplished um, musician, played the piano, classical. Sam was tickling the ivories, and Edna was drooling over him, saying, play it again, Sam. <laughs> And, you know, and I mean, I can imagine, but she said to me, John, when I was going to Paris, we'd met up about, and she said, John, you must photograph him, get those eyes. And I did that for Edna. And, of course, it made the cover of this book called um, Centenary Sadders. That's, um, you know. Any photographers here? Any guys? All digital? Excellent. But I hope this has worked, because I've done this presentation a couple of times now in various places. And normally I'm a bit more slicker, but I, you know, it took me six hour drive yesterday coming up in the dark and the rain. And I was thinking about it, and um, I had a lovely lunch with Patricia and Donald. In fact, I said to Donald, I was telling the story, Don, you go and do the presentation for me, and uh, that would be great. But um, it's just great to be here, and the lads, you know, sort of... Uh, Anything else? But well, I wanted to ask you, when I talk about Diana, I'm not talking about theory, you know, so, you know, this word I use, but there's something, there was something, she was the human face of the royal family. I mean, she just was. And she was in that relationship, um, having to cope with the other lady, you know, now Queen Camilla, you know, and it was kind of like that whole dynasty, you know, because I, I mean, I'm fascinated, um, by the royal family, only because Queen Victoria was queen in 1938, and photography was invented in Paris in 1939. Queen Victoria and her consort understood that power to get, you know, I mean, a photograph doesn't need translation, and they used photography to propagate that whole thing, like the queen with her dogs, Queen Victoria. Look at me, I'm just like my subjects. I have a dog as well. And, and earlier on this year, I went to the uh, Clarence House, sorry, Kensington Palace, where they had an exhibition of the Royal Photographic Collection. It's the most extraordinary collection of photographs in the world. Only diminished by the 
the digital, there's a picture by David Bailey of, of uh, the Queen, obviously taken digitally. And that loses something for me, because when I see people, digital photographs, it's like, I'm looking at you, you're real, that is Donald, that is, you know. I can go to Madame Tussauds and say, ah, oh, yeah, that's Patricia, that's Donald. And that's digital for me. It's not the real deal. Where with black and white film, the chemicals, it's, it's, it, just, it just works. It has that sort of, it's, it's, for me, it's, it has that kind of spiritual connection for me, which the other thing doesn't, you know. Done! Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you so much, John. We're going to have another piece of music now from Liam and Michael. Thank you for that lovely music and a really heartfelt thank you to John for such an interesting evening and being so generous with his stories and delighted to see some new faces in the audience this evening. So if you'd like to be notified of events like this, you can leave your details at the desk before you leave. We can add you to our mailing list. The Word is back next on Wednesday the 30th of November, so please follow us on social media and check our website for updates. We'll have the exhibition uh, that's behind us here for a number of weeks and we hope we'll have a new library soon to do it justice in a nice literary room, <laughs> which was the intention in 2009, John. <laughs> um, so thank you all for, for coming this evening. And we, we might be so bold as to ask for one more uh, piece before we finish, if that's okay. <laughs> I think we should close off with a tune. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.